This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Remember, no need to remember titles, nor dates of cases, nor statute, no section numbers, don't need them. And this chapter, Chapter 3, Statute Law, is where we're going to first come across cases. I did mention Earl of Oxford's case in, in the previous uh, Chapter 1, but this is where we're beginning to get into cases in a more serious way. I will tell you about many of them, but I'm only telling you because they illustrate principles of law, and it's those principles that you need to remember. If I were simply to say what the principle was, personally, I believe that would probably be more boring than watching grass grow. More boring than watching paint dry. It would just be so dull that I can't bring myself to believe that you would prefer that. So what I'm going to do is I will tell you the stories. I will embellish them. I will tell bits which are not officially known. That's another way of saying I shall lie or, or add on bits. But it's to try and impress upon you what the principle of the law was that was established or confirmed by that case and it's that principle that you remember not the facts don't remember the facts of the case remember the story because the story tells you the principle is that clear then let's go on statute law this is law which is passed by government parliament but they Parliament, you know, Parliament passes laws, and so the House of Commons, the House of Lords, and, and the House of Commons hears bills as they're being discussed, and then it goes on. It's not like America, where they've just gone into meltdown because the uh, Senate in America can't agree on the finance bill, and therefore the American government has closed down. All non-essential services have ceased, and people have been sent home without pay. The people who are essential have to go into work without pay, but they're all compensated, both those that are non-essential and those that are essential are um, paid. Ultimately, they get back pay retrospectively applied. They're called essentials and non-essentials, but that caused a little bit of um, concern. But a bit of a stigma. What you, why do you want? Why you're not in work? I'm not essential. Well, if you're not essential, why have you got a job? So they've changed the name recently to exempt and non-exempt, or accepted and not accepted, uh, for people who are accepted from going into work and not accepted. That is, they do have to go into work. Um, so Parliament passes laws with our two chambers: House of Lords, House of Commons. And only Parliament can change those laws, despite the fact that some judges, and notably there was a High Court, then became master of the rolls, there was the, the kingpin and the Court of Appeal, a man called Lord Denning, and he innovatively introduced new ways of interpreting laws which had been passed by governments, and his ways invariably were fair and right and sensible, but the interpretation was off the wall. So then he would recommend that the loser should appeal to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court was then in a situation of saying, well, Denning is, is right, you know, because his decision is fair and it's reasonable, but it goes against statute, it goes against the statute law. How can we wriggle in order to reach the same decision, if only for different reasons than Denning, because Denning's decision was a good decision. But the House of Lords, these five senior people had to wriggle in order to, to get around and interpret the law and, and find a word that was maybe a little bit vague and that they could interpret it in a different way. Wonderful. It was used to wonderful reading to read the uh, athleticism and acrobats that these five acrobats that these five law lords had to go through to try and find a way of saying that Denning was right. Anyway. Only Parliament officially can change those laws or repeal or get rid of those laws. Uh, not again, not like uh, America where uh, Mr. Trump was 
seems to be trumping Obama's previous law about Obamacare and Medicare. Anyway, we're not bothered about America, we're worried about English law. So it starts off with a green paper. Now, I say it starts with a green paper, it doesn't really, does it? And the green paper doesn't suddenly appear on a desk in, in the House of Parliament. It actually probably starts with local groups asking and meeting with their local member of parliament and saying, well, do you not think that we should have some sort of system whereby this should happen? Or, or why is it necessary to keep chasing poor defenseless little foxes? Um, it's not fair and, and the poor things are killed and ripped apart and it's inhumane. Well, yeah, but foxes are not human and therefore it is inhumane, whatever you do. But anyway, it's inhumane and so these groups of people would lobby their MPs and the, the lobby is a, a big hallway in the Palace of Westminster and groups would go and they would meet with their MP and they would say, look, we think we should have the law changed in this area. And if there are enough MPs, I, I think there have to be, I have a feeling it has to be 10 members of parliament of like mind will sign to have a bill, a green paper introduced. And once that green paper is introduced, that is a proposal for the new law. And they will, they will word the, the law, they will, they will set about writing out the law. They themselves won't do it because they're not necessarily skilled in this, but they have, they have departments that will do it. So a green paper is a proposal for the new law. And after the green paper comes a white paper. How do you remember which comes first, green or white? Because G comes before W in the alphabet. So green paper followed by a white paper. And the white paper will then have um, comments received. There will be written comments available to be, to be made by all the members of Parliament. And having received those comments, suggesting that maybe a proposed new law could incorporate these little bits of extra twists then the new law will be drafted. And that's presented to the House. It's introduced to the House. It's called first reading. And the law, this new proposed law, is read through. It's a formality. It's just read through the House. And if you ever visit the House of Commons and sit in the visitors' gallery, <coughs> something like a first reading and for some debates as well, you wonder what your MPs are doing. The last time I went, uh, let's be honest, the first time I went, uh, I sat in the visitors' gallery, and if there were ten members of parliament in the chamber, I would I would be surprised. There was a speaker sitting there acting as a chairperson, and there were a couple of people on the government benches, and three or four people on the opposition benches, and two or three on the cross benches with with the, the third party benches, the independents and uh, social Democratics and Democratic Unionist people. So I bet there weren't ten within the within the, the chamber. Anyway, first reading introduced to the House. Which House? The House of Commons typically, but not always, such has been the weight of traffic of bills being introduced, that instead of introducing them all in the House of Commons and moving them onto the House of Lords, they're now introduced into both. And, and the House of Lords will read and discuss and pass it down, the House of Commons read and pass it up. But it's not the same one. They will hear one about traffic, they will hear one about family, and, and, and they, will, they will swap over. Well, having heard traffic, they'll pass it down. Having heard family, they'll move it up. So um, apparently it saves parliamentary time, although well, I can't myself work out how, because they still have to go through both, both chambers. But anyway, so that's the introduction, first reading. Second reading is a debate. Uh, about the merits of the proposed legislation uh, and, and where there are critiques and criticisms of it and where people say it, it shouldn't even be it shouldn't even be anywhere near Parliament, it should be scrapped for right away and, and so it's a, a general debate, full house, full moment. The next stage is a committee, an all party committee. This this actually should be over here, shouldn't it? It's, um, it's a proper stage. So we've got green paper, white paper, first reading, second reading, committee stage. And it's an all-party committee, so 
literally Conservatives, Labour, Social Democrats, Scottish National, all the Cymru, Plaid Cymru and, and so on. Uh, I'm, I think it's about 20 people on the committee and clearly the government, if it's a government sponsored bill, the government will want a majority to make sure that the bill does have an easy passage. So they'll probably put 11 people from government and maybe six from the opposition, two from the third party, and maybe a selection of others, maybe one from Social Democrats and one from Plaid Cymru. And there you would have your 20 cross-party members. So an all-party committee will discuss and amend the draft. And they will go through it line by line. Section by section, line by line, word by word, in order to eliminate any ambiguities, any possibility of misinterpretation, they will they will go through it so so carefully to make sure that everything is totally non misunderstandable, that you could not, in any circumstance, misunderstand exactly what is meant by the by the the drafted legislation so green paper white paper first reading second reading committee stage after committee stage it then goes back to the house with third reading because it's now in a format which is ready to be voted on if you like and after third reading and it's been approved at this report stage. Report stage, the amended draft is presented to the House for approval. So the committee that amended it, it's then presented by the report. And then third reading, we then have the debate. And the debate will then final approve. They will then, all those in favor, those against, and there would be a count, and four people, two from, probably two from each side of the, the House, one from, two from Conservative, two from, and they will count the votes and they will go forward to the speaker and they'll present the results of the count. The eyes to the left and the nose to the right. So I, I don't know how you do that. How do you make your eyes go to the left and your nose go to the right? Well, that's what they do. Eyes to the left, nose to the right. And that will determine whether or not the bill has passed through that stage. Because then it goes to the other house. The house, typically the House of Commons is where it starts. Then it will move up to the House of Lords. And the House of Lords has the power to reject it. So they pass it back to the Council, I know we don't like it, and pass it back to the Council, and they can do that for a year and a day. But after that, their power runs out. They can no longer keep rejecting it. Because, and it goes back into history, because there were, I think, 800 and some Lords available and eligible to sit in the House of Lords. And many of these were hereditary. These are people who are direct linear descendants from people who have fought alongside Henry V in France in the 16th century. Um, and linear descendants have, have carried the name, carried the title, and therefore they're allowed to... There's no concept of intelligence or smartness or, or, or savvy or streetwise. There's no concept of that. These were, in my view, uh, potentially just a, a group of Hooray Henrys who enjoyed the Sloan Square lifestyle. And so in relatively recent times the availability of sitting in the House of Lords rather than just having the title, the availability of sitting in the House of Lords as part of the process of passing legislation has been severely restricted and the hereditary peers, I think their numbers have been reduced, the, the ones who are available to sit have been reduced. Of course, there are other lords being created all the time. These are life peers. These are people whose title will not pass to their descendants. There was an hereditary peer, and it was Lord Tommy Pandy, who used to, Bernard somebody or other, who used to be the Speaker of the House of Commons. When he was ennobled, he was then given more than a life peerage. He was given a, an hereditary peerage. Uh, but he didn't have any sons. So the, the title was not going to pass down to his son. I think I'm right on that. It's never been asked of that for, so don't worry about it, and don't even bother looking it up. Third reading, then, is approval by the House. Same procedure in the next House, in the, in the House of Lords. And they will, they will pass it through green paper, white paper, first reading, second reading, committee stage, report stage, third reading. 
They, and they will do the same. And they will then approve. They will vote in favour or against the eyes to the left and the nose to the right. Um, and if they approve it, then it goes to the monarch for royal assent. And in theory, the monarch has the power to withhold royal assent. I suggest to you that if the monarch ever did do that, that would likely spell the start of the end of the monarchy and the start of the beginning of a republic of the United Kingdom. But it would no longer be called the United Kingdom, would it? Because there would be no monarch anymore, so kingdom would go. I wonder, they, surely they didn't in Victoria, nor in Elizabeth's time. Why do they not call the United Queendom? I wonder, that's never been asked either. So royal assent. So, do you want to go through those again now? Just in your head with me. Green paper, white paper, first reading, second reading. Committee stage, report stage, third reading, other house. Green paper, white paper, first reading, second reading. Committee stage, report stage, third reading, royal assent. Statutory interpretation rules. There are statutory, there are statutory interpretation rules. The statutory rules of interpretation, but there are also presumptions about statute. And we're looking at interpreting. I've already said that both houses, commons and lords, make every effort to avoid ambiguity. But such is the volume of bills going through and the workload and the responsibility on all these members of Parliament, both House of Commons and House of Lords, that there are bound to be situations where ambiguity or uncertainty, vagueness does creep in. And so there are statutory interpretation rules. There are also statutory interpretation presumptions, and we'll look at those separately. But I'm going to look now at the statutation, and you'll see from this page, you can see cases. I'm going to go through those. I'm going to tell you the stories, but I'm going to do it at the start of the next lecture. So this has only been a short lecture. I'm going to break off here and then we'll come back and we'll look at the rules of interpretation.